it feels like a lot of this is people with a ton of money not really knowing what else to do with their money. Totally. Like every journalist I shared the story of my NFT sale with was like open mouthed gasping. And every artist I shared it with was like, oh, some rich guy showed up and like paid a lot of money for something that you made for reasons that you don't quite understand. Like that's a Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm John Favreau. Welcome to Offline. My guest today is Kevin Roos technology columnist at the New York Times. Kevin came on to talk about crypto. He recently wrote a fantastic explainer in the Times called The Latecomer's Guide to Crypto, where he says that his strongest belief about crypto is that it's terribly explained. He fixes that by describing blockchains, NFTs, and all the rest of the crypto jargon in accessible, everyday language. More importantly, he makes a compelling case for why we should all care about crypto, even if we might have our doubts, which I certainly do. So I invited Kevin on to chat more about this strange, newish world. How might crypto billionaires influence our politics? Why does it seem like our economy runs on vibes? Is it possible that crypto does to commerce what social media has done to communication? And if so, what are the hard questions we should be asking right now, before it's too late? Here's Kevin Roos. Thank you for doing this. Um, my producers have been uh, suggesting an episode about crypto forever. Uh, I've avoided it because... I know so embarrassingly little about crypto than even when people try to explain it to me, like I don't even do a good job pretending to nod along. I just do like a dead eyed stare. So, um, but you've written this like incredibly accessible explainer for the New York Times a couple months ago. So maybe we can start there. Um, you say that your strongest held belief about crypto is that it's terribly explained, which just is mine too. How would you explain what it is? Wow. Um, well, we could spend many hours on that so i'll <laughs> i'll try to Basics. sort of distill it so so crypto you know is is generally accepted shorthand for cryptocurrency these days it's also sort of anything that relates to blockchains um whether or not it's supposedly digital currency blockchains are these uh ownerless shared databases um basically you can think of them like google sheets without Google. Um, and so they can uh, be used to run cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum, or they can be used to do things like NFTs. Um, there's all other kinds of branches and tributaries of crypto. But basically, crypto is sort of the, the, the catch-all name for this whole world of software, um, sort of currency, payment systems, etc., that are being built on top of these relatively new kinds of databases called blockchains. Can you explain why digital currency like Bitcoin and blockchains, like what the fundamental difference is between them and regular currency and banks, I guess would be the analogous thing to blockchains? Yeah, so let's just walk through a simple, you know, transaction. Like if I want to send you $10 um, through the regular banking system, um, you know, I'd probably use Venmo or Zelle or some app like that. And those apps um, connect to our bank accounts or our credit cards, which are connected to bank accounts. And when I want to transfer $10 to you, um, you know, my bank goes in and debits $10 from the entry in the database saying how much money I have and adds $10 to the database entry saying how much money you have. And we trust those institutions to carry out that transaction for us. Mm -hmm. um, we are not directly transferring the money. We are instructing those institutions to transfer the money. And so what, um, you know, we would call those intermediated transactions because there, there have to be sort of functional, um, trusted middlemen in order for us to both feel comfortable doing that transaction. Right. Um, what crypto does is essentially takes out the middleman and replaces it with this thing called the blockchain, which is this database that is run on a network of computers all over the world and is structured such that um, you don't need to trust any one particular computer on the network um, in order to, to trust that your transaction is going to happen. So I would send you know $10 worth of Bitcoin or Ethereum to an address that you gave me that 
transaction would be recorded on this database that is public and that anyone can see and inspect. And we would both sort of be able to trust that that transaction would happen in a relatively timely way without the need for Chase or Bank of America or Wells Fargo standing in the middle. So one more basic explanation before we dive in. You mentioned NFTs. Uh, I know that stands for non-fungible token. But but what are NFTs and like where do they fit into this whole crypto craze? Yeah, NFTs are sort of more recent. Uh, cryptocurrency dates back to like 2009, uh, mm-hmm. which is when when Bitcoin sort of emerged. Um, NFTs emerged much later, like 2015, 2016, 2017, um, and basically the 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 technical breakthrough that sort of gave rise to them was the idea that. On certain blockchains, uh, mainly Ethereum, which is sort of the second largest crypto uh, ecosystem, you could create these things called non-fungible tokens, which essentially were uh, one-of-a-kind digital goods. Um, So instead of, you know, sending currency back and forth, you you could create these tokens, these tokens that were not money, but that existed on blockchains the same way that cryptocurrencies did and that crucially were distinct from one another. So, you you know, fungible in in economics is just a term that means like, I can give you a dollar bill, you can give me a dollar bill. It doesn't really matter which dollar bill it is because all the dollar bills have the same purchasing power. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's true of Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies too. Like, it doesn't really matter which Bitcoin it is if you have a Bitcoin. Non-fungible tokens were were not interchangeable like that. So you could stake a claim to some asset using a kind of cryptographic signature on the blockchain. Does that clear anything up? Yeah, well, all? I was just saying, just, just to give everyone a, a real clear example of this, can you tell the story about how you sold an NFT for, what was it, like over half a million dollars at an auction, something like that? Yeah, this is my accidental crypto millionaire phase uh, <laughs> a, a villain origin story. No, so I, I was sort of interested in crypto theoretically. And then um, these NFTs. For your job. For your job. Yeah, right? yeah. For my, for my job, like I'd been covering it. I just thought it was like wacky and, and interesting. And then these NFT sales started happening. You know, NBA Top Shot started selling like NFTs of LeBron James dunking for like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, you know, celebrities, Jimmy Fallon started getting them. And, and uh, and so I was like, well, why should they have all the fun? I should I should try this out. And and so what I decided to do and got approval to do from my bosses at the New York Times was to write a column essentially about NFTs, explaining what they were and why so many people were talking about them, and then take that column and actually turn it into an NFT and put it up for auction uh, with all the proceeds going to charity. And this was like just going to be a stunt. Like I, I had no like expectation that this would bring in any real amount of money. Um, can you can you talk about like what the process is like to turn your article into an NFT? Like even that, I'm like, what what does that even mean? What what, what happens there? Yeah, I had to learn all this too. So the first step was you have to get like an image because you know most NFT platforms today like perf- you know they they work with images. So I had. A designer at the New York Times, like, you know, create an image of my column, like a PNG file, and then I uploaded it to this platform, um, which kind of simplifies the whole sort of creation process. And then that image got uploaded to a decentralized file hosting service called, I kid you not, the Interplanetary File System, which just sounds <laughs> like metal as hell. And then, um, and then I had to mint the token, which is to create to say I had to, using this platform, create the the um, the asset that would live on the blockchain that would point to that particular copy of the image of my column. So the the NFT, it's a little complicated, but basically the NFT isn't the, the image itself. It's the kind of link that points to the image that allows someone to say that image, that copy of this image belongs to me. And there's only one. There's only one Kevin Roos original piece in the New York Times that has been NFT'd, which I know is not a verb. <laughs> Correct. No, it, it is a verb if you want it to be. Um, so then, so then you put it up for auction. So and- I put it up for auction, and my colleagues are all like clowning on me about like the fact that no one's going to bid on my stupid NFT. 
And uh, <laughs> and then I like wake up one morning and there's like been a bidding war overnight and a bunch of like NFT whales have like started just bidding the price up to these astronomical levels and ends up selling for 350 ETH, which uh, I at the time I sold it was equivalent to about $560,000. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then by the time I actually was able to give the money away to charity, um, which took a few months for like some dumb administrative reasons, the price of Ethereum had like almost doubled. So I ended up giving away like $1.1 million to charity from this stupid NFT sale. So like, no offense to you because your writing is wonderful. I, I read it all the time. But like, why? Why did you, why did people <laughs> bid that much? What What is the value in... In, in speculating uh, on N- NFTs. Why are people doing this? Come on, John. You just have to believe in the value of your own work. I mean, every, every writer <laughs> what am I doing here? <laughs> should be trying to sell their columns for a million dollars a piece. No, I, so I, I asked them. I, I went back to all the people who had bid in the auction and I sent them all messages. And I said, like, hi, I'm Kevin from the New York Times. This is my NFT. Like, why the hell did you bid so much money on this thing that you could read? Literally, you could read for free on nytimes.com. And it was sort of interesting. The, the responses were varied. There were a couple people who said, like, basically, this was essentially an advertising expense for me. Like, I knew, you know, if I won the auction, I would get in the paper, and getting in the paper has a certain value to me as an entrepreneur or an artist or whatever. Hmm. So that was sort of a, you know, marketing write-off for them. But then at the high end, like, that, that doesn't make sense after a certain price point, because it would just right. be cheaper to buy an ad. So at the higher prices, uh, the people bidding, like, six figures on this thing... It was really about kind of like, well, there was some speculative potential. Like if NFTs do become the art of the future, um, you know, owning the New York Times' first ever NFT could be uh. like owning, you know, a Rembrandt or something. Um, and so there were some people that that had had speculative aims for it. And then there were just some people who were like kind of in it for the vibes, like, like they were just like, I think it's cool that you did this stunt. Like, I wanted to support it. I've got a bunch of money. Um, you know, I'm building an NFT collection, and this just seemed cool. And, um, and like, that seems ridiculous, except in the context of, like, the art world, where, like, rich people show up to art fairs all the time and just, like, spend vast sums of money on things that the rest of us would look at and go, like, why would you spend money on that? Yeah, I was going to say, like, from the outside with my limited base of knowledge on all of this, it feels like a lot of this is people with a ton of money not really knowing what else to do with their money. Though, as you point out, that's not a, that's not necessarily a new phenomenon, <laughs> right? Like, because people have been doing that with art for a long time in a whole bunch of other areas. Totally. Like, every journalist I shared the story of my NFT sale with was, like, open-mouthed gasping. And every artist I shared it with was like, oh, some rich guy showed up and like paid a lot of money for something that you made for reasons that you don't quite understand. Like, that's a Tuesday. (laughs) (laughs) Offline is brought to you by Blue Moon. Share any summer memories you've had where you've enjoyed every second of the experience or any upcoming summer plans you have. Oh, upcoming plans I have. We got a couple of plans. I'm going to go to the beach and I'm going to bring a cooler and I'm going to fill it full of moons that are blue. Wow, look at you. Look at you. I'll bring the um, I'll bring the orange slices. Thanks, John. How's that sound? Like soccer practice. Like so. Well, but what are you gonna bring? There's a cheesiness to this t- tone. I can't I can't get behind. You know what? Aren't you coming with us? <laughs> yeah. Nah, I'm busy. Nah, that's a bummer. I'll well, just I'll just be doing. Let's go on the record. Say we did invite you. I'll yeah. just be drinking alone in my house. Yeah, plain plain mist. <laughs> Summer's the most fun when you can savor every moment. So why spend it drinking a light beer you don't actually enjoy? Blue Moon Light Sky is a light beer with incredible flavor you can only expect from Blue Moon, and it's the perfect companion to those summer moments you want to make the most of. It's so good you'll want to savor every sip. Blue Moon Light Sky citrus wheat and tropical wheat are two refreshingly light citrusy wheat beers, checking in at just 95 calories per 12 ounces. Both beers are bright and crisp with a twist of citrus blue moon light sky citrus wheat is brewed with real tangerine peel and blue moon light sky tropical wheat is brewed with pineapple and orange peel get blue moon light sky citrus wheat and light sky tropical wheat delivered by visiting get.bluemoonbeer.com slash offline to see your delivery options that's get.bluemoonbeer.com slash offline blue moon light sky savor every sip celebrate responsibly blue moon brewing company golden colorado ale offline is brought to you by truebill 
From forgotten free trials to automatic renewals, when big companies keep charging you, Truebill is your secret weapon to save you money on subscriptions you don't need. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill. That's not nothing. Because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel, Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. And your Truebill concierge is there. We need them to cancel unwanted subscriptions so you don't have to. You can even cancel them if they don't perform for you. Cancel them. Yeah. Let them know. Uh, look, love Truebill. We've talked about this before. I had a whole bunch of subscriptions I was paying for that just kind of added up over the years. I used Truebill. Suddenly, I saved a bunch of money. They're all gone. Don't get not getting the annoying emails from them anymore either. Cancel culture for good. You bet. It's cancel culture, but for good. Matthew B. saved $660 for the year on his direct TV bill, so give it up for Matthew B. Don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash offline. Go right now. Truebill.com slash offline. It could save you thousands a year. Truebill.com slash offline. Offline is brought to you by Fume. We talk about communication and connection a lot on this show. I know a few people that smoke or vape, and I'm sure you do too. How does that habit cut into your connection with that person? Um, It makes me uh, worry for their health. And worry for their health and also it's you know sort of smells you get that smoke smell when you're around people uh we all know about the health risks but if smoking has evolved from a casual habit to something that's taking over your life you've got to check out fume fume is a natural inhaler designed for a better safer natural way to quit cigarettes it's a no smoke no vape and no nicotine replacement for the hand-to-mouth habit of smoking for most people quitting cold turkey doesn't work so fume handcrafted these wooden inhalers infused with plant oils studied to curb cravings they have core flavors like peppermint with minty notes and lemonberry bliss for a sweeter experience all of their flavors are 100 percent natural no harmful chemicals no artificial flavors and no nicotine I like there's like wine tasting notes from these yeah i got these a, vapes this is a, just a little peppermint i'm getting in this one mm-hmm. cigar box they've got thousands of five-star reviews from smokers who tried everything else until this worked for them you gotta quit if you're you know you're smoking cigarettes it's just it's a it's, it's, it's terrible bad bad for you Look, we you know we've all had uh, we've had these friends that that need this. So uh, you know if you're looking for an alternative to for, to patches or pills, you know give your friend Fume. It combines the benefits of plants and behavioral science to distract smokers from their cravings in a natural way. Whether you're a smoker or ex-smoker who still struggles with cravings, Fume is on a mission to help one million people quit smoking by 2025. Head to breathefume.com slash crooked and use promo code crooked to save 10% off your entire order. That's 10% off your entire order when you head to b r e a t h e F-U-M dot com slash cricket and use code crooked. Let's step back to sort of uh, the, the the broader case for this, because like, let's let's say you are someone who thinks crypto is like financial speculation, which I know is more in the sort of NFT category, or you think it's risky or you think it's pointless. You're happy using your non-digital currency. Why should you care about crypto? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I should say that my goal in this conversation in the piece I wrote for the Times, like in every other conversation about crypto, is not to convince people to buy crypto. (laughs) It is not to convince people that crypto is a good investment or that you should run out and convert your 401k into Bitcoin. Like, please do not do that. Uh, I'm I'm not addressing the question of whether this is good or bad. I'll, I'll just address whether why I find it interesting and why I think people, especially, frankly, progressives who who in my experience are sort of not interested in this you know much more so than than my like libertarian and and more conservative friends should pay attention to what's going on uh, the first is that I, I just think it, that crypto is not going anywhere hmm. um, and you know obviously in the past couple weeks we've had like a huge market crash like Bitcoin is like half what it was but I think what people don't realize is that a lot of of money has been made. Like the, the amount of money that has been made in crypto in the past five years is astronomical. Um, you know, it's it's the only sort of close comparison is like the discovery of oil in the Middle East. And so you have people who are now extraordinarily wealthy, um, who are now moving their money out of crypto and into things that we care about, into politics, into cultural production into activism. Um, Sam Bankman-Fried, who, um, you know, is a a big crypto entrepreneur, he started this big crypto exchange called FTX, uh, has said that he might spend a billion dollars in the 2024 election cycle um, on Democratic campaigns, largely. So, and like, and that's way more than any donor has ever spent in an election cycle. And he's a 
crypto guy. And so, you know, when we have people like Sam Bankman Freed showing up with bags of money into election cycles when we have, you know, the the mayors of New York City and Miami and other cities like going full crypto. Like, I think we need to pay attention and to understand what it is that these people want when they say, like, I want to spend a billion dollars on, you know, elections in 2024. So that's one reason is like these the people who have won the crypto game or are winning the crypto game are some of the most powerful people in the world. And they're just sort of taking their money out of crypto and doing more immediately relevant things with it. Okay. The second thing is I think it could go really wrong. Like, like I really, uh, I really <laughs> think that, you know, I'm not a fatalist. I don't think that like all crypto is, you know, evil and is, is predestined to go badly, but it could. Um, it's, a, it's a very radical idea, this idea of like detaching money, software, uh, communication, social media, like all of these, these things that crypto people want to move onto the blockchain, like that's, that would radically reshape society. And if we're not thoughtful and careful about how it happens, if they're right, um, we could end up like very quickly living in a world that we don't recognize or feel comfortable in. And so I think for the same reason that like, like, I, I think we all kind of know what the problems with, like, social media are now. I mean, that's right. one, of, one of the pieces that, you know, one of the things you've done so well on this podcast and, and in other, uh, you know, shows that, you, that you've done is, like, I think that we're, we've pretty well documented that there were some pretty messed up things about, like, the last generation of internet services. And I wish we had been having those conversations in 2012. Yeah. Like, I wish we had gotten there sooner. And I wish people had started thinking about the the potential downsides before they started, you know, electing autocrats and leading to, you know, mass violence in, in faraway places. And I just, I just kind of want to tell people like the time to pay attention to crypto is now when the problems are still somewhat solvable. Do we, um, what do we know about who's investing in crypto right now and who's getting rich? Like, what are those demographics like? It's hard to say um, because so much of it takes place under anonymous and pseudonymous accounts. Um, there have been some surveys that suggest that you know the average crypto uh, you know person is sort of who you'd expect. Like it's like a you know white man in their thirties, like with a six figure income. Yeah. Um, but I, I should say too that there are some indications that that in the past few years the the user base has really broadened um, and that some of the fastest growing places for uh, crypto are outside the U.S., are places where they have unstable currencies, uh, you know, authoritarian regimes, capital controls. So so not the like crypto bros in Lambos that we think of when we think of crypto. Well, that sort of brings me to my next question. I mean, we've been talking about sort of the financial speculation part of crypto, and that's why I think what gets the most coverage. But like, what are aside from pure financial speculation? What are some other reasons that people would get into digital currency? Would find this useful? Yeah. So there, there. I will say, like, it's hard to know. I, I mean, I guess we'll see which people were in it for the speculation. You know, by by who sort of drops out of the market once all the prices have crashed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like there are a lot of tourists, um, and some of some number of them will leave and go back to their consulting jobs or whatever but um but i think that the the reasons that i've heard that people are interested in this beside financial speculation are some of them are political and ideological they really hate the federal reserve they really hate um centralization as a concept uh, you know, some of these people are, are you know, right-wing libertarians. Some of them are, like, socialists. Like, I've met, you know, people who are, like, I was in Occupy Wall Street, and I hate big banks, and, like, building a new financial system on the blockchain is how we are going to, like, stick it to Goldman Sachs. And, like, that is a deeply held conviction that they have. Um, huh. I, I think there's also, like, like, I'm fascinated by the just the community of crypto, like, I, I, I think that a part of it that is hard to understand from the outside is, like, this is a social scene. And it's one that, like, is sort of doing for people what religion used to do for people. It's giving them, you know, rituals, like the, you know, 
sort of laser eyes, Twitter photos and whatever, like all the dumb little things, the tweeting, you know, GM, like that's all ritual. And it's all part of this like myth making and community building that these people are doing. And people like have friends and build social lives and go to parties. And like this takes over their life in a way that I don't think happens with like, you know, certificates of deposit or like savings bonds. But is the is the driving belief behind this religion like uh, feeling towards crypto that central banks are bad, that we shouldn't trust them, that big banks are bad, that we shouldn't trust them? Like, is that the belief sort of driving people uh, towards towards crypto that like we just can't trust the financial institutions that currently operate the global economy? I think that's a big part of it. I think that you know, what you would find if you could do kind of an ethnography of, of you know, who invests and believes in crypto is that, in my experience, it's it's largely correlated with just mistrust of institutions in general. Yeah. That there are a lot of people who feel like our institutions have failed us, whether it's big banks, the media, the government, um, you know, the big tech companies, for that matter. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of the people you know, who are building things in so-called Web3 are like, just, they don't want Mark Zuckerberg to control the internet forever. You know, they they don't like that there are like six websites now and that they're all kind of terrible. And uh, I also think there's an element of nostalgia to it for a lot of the people, especially, you know, people who remember the internet as it was before, like the great, you know, homogenization. Yeah. Um, and like, remember all the weird, bulletin boards and Usenet groups and like, you know, GeoCities sites and like just want the internet to feel a little weirder and wilder again. Um, so I think, I, but I think the inst- the distrust of institutions is is highly correlated with interest in crypto. Much like it is almost every development in society over the last <laughs> decade or so now. Totally. Um, so obviously, like, there's a huge debate about crypto, just like there's about everything else that happens these days. Um, you've you've labeled yourself a crypto moderate, um, so I figured you could help us break break it down. Um, let's start with the crypto skeptics. I've heard them offer like two primary reasons to be skeptical about crypto. One, they think it's basically a scam, and and two, that it's horrible for the environment. What are some of the arguments you've heard about why crypto is a scam? Yeah, I think there there are a couple different flavors of this argument. One is that uh, one, which I think is pretty indisputable, is that crypto is full of scams, <laughs> like that people just get scammed all the time. Okay. And their crypto gets stolen, their NFTs get stolen. Um, there's like, you know, there, there's sort of like a big hack every week, it seems like, um, where just like hundreds of millions of dollars in crypto just vanishes into some hacker's uh, wallet. So there's, that's one flavor. The strong, the strong version of that argument that I've heard is that like crypto as a whole is a scam because these are assets whose value is, you know, primarily derived from speculation. Right. And it needs new money to keep coming into the system. You know, people need to be able to dump their crypto onto less sophisticated investors so that the price keeps going up. And, and like the, the sort of claim is that, you know, that none of this stuff has any intrinsic value. And so if you are, you know, invested in it, you know, all you're trying to do is figure out how to sell your coins or your, your NFTs or your assets to someone dumber and less sophisticated than you who's willing to, to pay a lot for them. So the fact that the argument that there's no intrinsic value to any of this, and especially to some of these NFTs, is quite compelling to me. And I'm wondering, like, what's the counter argument to that? That, like, no, there is there is value. Well, I think, you know, I, I'm not an apologist for either side of it. Like, I, I, I genuinely want to make it clear that I'm, I'm making, like, a descriptive argument and not a normative <laughs> argument here. No, I know. We get, <laughs> we get you covered. Okay. Don't worry. Great. Um, so I think the, the sort of, you know, one counter argument I've heard is that, look, there are a lot of things in life that we pay for and we value despite them not having a ton of intrinsic value. Mm-hmm. So, like, I, you know, I have clothes. I have a car. Uh, you know, it's, it's not the, you know, the fanciest car, but it's like a car and people buy luxury handbags, people buy art for their walls, people, you know, buy expensive meals out at restaurants. Like 
you know, none of those things are strictly necessary to the functioning of life. Um, and yet we, you know, a, a large part of our economy is essentially things that make us feel good or that signal status in some way. Um, and so, you know, even if that's all crypto was like, that's still, you know, a big piece of it. There are, the other argument that I've heard is that this idea of decentralization itself is the thing that has intrinsic value. Mm. That people put a value on being able to send money, information, uh, data in a way that does not flow through one giant company or big bank. And that that is the intrinsic value um, of crypto. Uh, so I, I think you can you can take a number of tacks with that, but those are the two arguments that I hear most frequently. And what about sort of the security argument, right? That there's all these people getting their, their crypto stolen all the time. Like the, the people who are sort of, uh, you know, pro crypto, what do they say about sort of like making sure this is a system that is more secure so that people don't just get like hacked all the time? I, you know, they basically say, look, it's still early. And, you know, if you remember like back in, you know, 1998, like, you know, on your, you know, Windows 98 desktop, like you would get a lot of viruses and it was kind of dangerous to download software from the internet and like people's, you know, people lost data and files and money all the time to like scams. And gradually, like we built spam filters and antivirus software and like the technology got better at handling that stuff for us so that the experience of using it got safer. And so they believe that like as time goes on, like it will just get less dangerous to take part in these transactions. Okay. So what about uh, the folks who say that crypto is bad for the environment? What's that argument? So the argument there is largely about uh, what are called proof of work blockchains, which the, the, you know, the two most popular cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and, and uh, Ethereum, both run um, on proof of work blockchains. And proof of work blockchains are, are essentially designed to waste a bunch of energy in order to provide security to the network. So you can, you know, you've probably seen like the images of these like mining farms where they have, you know, 20,000 high powered computers, um, just like in a warehouse somewhere. What those computers are actually doing is just like, essentially trying to solve puzzles, like meaningless, arbitrary puzzles. Mm -hmm. And they're competing to do that. And there's a financial reward if they win. And so that structure is what sort of makes the whole network run. And uh, it just consumes phenomenal amounts of electricity. And you just you have to keep these computers running all the time if you want the reward. And so you essentially have like a useless set of computations that require a ton of energy being conducted at all times to power these networks. And what's the counter argument there? What, I mean, I, I, I've heard that like there's some digital currencies that are trying to use less energy. Like is that what, what's going on there? Yeah, so this is a well-known problem in the crypto community. They're very touchy about it um, when you point it out. Um, and they they will basically say one of two things. One one is like, you know, uh, look, the, the, you know, traditional banking industry uses a lot of energy too. Like think about all those bank branches that have to like, you know, light themselves up and all those ATMs that are constantly running and, and you know, those credit card processors. And you just don't like think about it that way because it's like so ingrained. Mm -hmm. um, they'll say, you know, a lot of crypto mining is transitioning to renewable energy. Um, and so, you know, it's not necessarily like the worst thing for the environment. And they will also say that, some newer blockchains are using a different type of mechanism to secure themselves. It's not proof of work. It's something called proof of stake, or it's a different one that uses like much, much less energy just as a function of how it works. Um, but, you know, that's that's sort of a convenient dodge because like the vast majority of crypto transactions still take place on blockchains that run on proof of work, which is this incredibly energy inefficient system. So it is. So right now, the, the the vast majority of sort of crypto transactions and just crypto in general is pretty energy inefficient. Correct. <laughs> Offline is brought to you by Blue Chew. It's time to. What's that? It's well, Tommy. It's time to dig yourself out of that winter hibernation. Spring is here. Spring is sprung, and it's time to get sprung with Blue Chew. Ugh. That's right. This episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Guys, confidence can take you far in life. It can also help you in the bedroom, especially when it comes time to step up to the plate. The mixing of metaphors it's is a really lot. They're defensive. Really, yeah, that's where Blue Chew comes in. 
Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis. Yes, that's what it is. I bet you didn't know up until now. I bet it was very, it was very yeah, subtle. It was subtle before. Uh, but in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost, in case you were like, no, I'm not kidding. At chewable tablets at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. I heard you, you keep them in the car. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, right here in the studio. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part? It's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. It's time to get off the couch and back to work. If you're, Oh, man. If your tool needs an upgrade, head to BlueChew.com. So if you could benefit from an extra confidence when it's time to perform, Blue Chew can help. We've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code CROOKED at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com. Promo code CROOKED to receive your first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. Offline is brought to you by Seeker. You rely on ratings to find good restaurants and hire talented local professionals because transparency and reliability help you make smart decisions. Right? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So why not trust similar ratings to assess the accuracy of the information you search online? This is where you insert a message of agreeance. Insert a message of agreeance. Is what it says. <laughs> agreeance. Agreeance. I, I just... Is that I like can, severance? Or is well, it, just, oh, any <laughs> Agreement. It's just a, it's the, such a common word. Never seen the word to go to, to go to agreeance. Have we you, obviously agree. We are. We will We will give you all the agreeance you need. Look, I use Seeker. I like Seeker a lot. I'm going to set my Seeker setting to... Don't give me anything English. with the word agreeance. Right. Yeah. Okay. Visit Seeker, a new search engine that lets you search with confidence. Seeker uses artificial intelligence to evaluate news and information and assigns a Seeker score that scores the quality of news results based on journalistic principles and general reliability. By analyzing content for subjectivity, persuasive techniques, and exaggeration, Seeker works to solve issues that can drastically impact our world like rapidly spreading misinformation. Only Seeker has a Seeker score that goes from 0 to 10. Lower scores are a big red flag to alert you that the content might be manipulated, unreliable, or inaccurate. With this smart tool, choice and control are back in your hands. I'm sitting with a couple of got smart a, tools smart right tool here. tool next to me, <laughs> sitting in the middle not listening. Are you ready? We can call them anything we want now. Are you ready to start feeling good about what you see online? Seek for yourself at seeker.com slash crooked. That's <laughs> S-E-E-K-R dot com slash crooked. Thank you. I haven't losing weight. Offline is brought to you by Future. Future believes that people motivate people, and having your own future coach isn't just the best approach, it's the only sustainable approach to health and fitness. Future has built the most talented team of fitness coaches on the planet. When you join Future, you get paired with the one that's right for you, your goals, and your experience. Future provides you with your own expert coach who gives you personalized daily coaching and a workout plan built just for you all through the Future app. Future coaches are your experts, partners in fitness, and regardless of how often you work out, your future coach will be there for you every day. John, just a couple notes from the network. I'm just not sure this is believable. Could you maybe drop and give us 20 and we'll read the rest of it for you? Sure. Yeah, okay. I'll do it right now. I'll give you a, I'll give you 50. How's that sound? Uh, Gabe, I just want to note that he's not actually doing it. <laughs> just um, Sorry, chime in to say, so Tommy, you, you want to watch John work out a bit? <laughs> Unbelievable! It's a spotter right here. You, you a spotter. It's like, it's like I don't believe. I don't believe you. I don't believe you can work out. <laughs> let me see it. Unbelievable! Tommy's not wearing sleeves right let's, now. Just so let's you see you work. See it. Let's see you work up a sweat. It's just, it's just, it's just... Oh no! I don't have any cash to pay you for this training session. <laughs> anyway, Where Gabe is great. This? Gabe would be really proud. Right, I regret speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Gabe is. Uh, he's there for me every day. Just was just with uh, mm-hmm. just texting with him earlier. I bet. Future isn't a fancy piece of equipment. This isn't a get fit quick plan. And this isn't a YouTube video with daily coaching and tailored workout plans. Your future coach will support you through every step of your fitness journey. There's no risk to try Future. And right now you can get 50% off your first three months and cancel anytime during the first 30 days at tryfuture.com slash crooked. That's tryfuture.com slash crooked. So obviously like the, you know, the crypto utopia is sort of looking like a little bit further away from reality from where we sit right now because the market kind of crashed in mid-May. Um, obviously, it's stabilized a bit since then, uh, but it's it's nowhere near its earlier highs. W- what happened? Well, I think, you know, if I, if I knew that, I would be a very rich trader somewhere, <laughs> <laughs> like sitting on a, on a yacht, um, but uh, especially if I knew it in advance. Um, right, yeah. But, I, you know, I think what it looks like is just a broad sort of market trend like tech stocks also fell 20 30 40 percent like netflix is down you know some crazy amount since uh since the beginning of the year and so what's interesting is that a lot of people who believe in crypto like thought that it would kind of be 
the exception, that when inflation was high and the Federal Reserve started raising interest rates, that uh, stocks would fall, but Bitcoin or Ethereum or crypto would would be the hedge. It would be the thing that went in the opposite direction. And instead, what's happened is just like everything went down together. Interesting. But it does seem like... It seems like so much of this market is based on when you were saying vibes earlier. I, I've been kind of thinking that myself. Like I didn't. I mean, like you know, I, you hear Elon Musk talking about like Dogecoin, and I was like, "What the fuck is that?" And then you go sort of like look into Dogecoin, and maybe you could explain a little bit about it. But it seems like it's something that was a a joke that became not a joke because everyone started talking about it. <laughs> like, and it became this vibe that actually suddenly made people rich. I don't know. What, am I right there? Yeah, totally. I mean, I, my macro thesis is that the whole economy runs on vibes now. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, why is GameStop, you know, worth what it's worth? Like, because vibes, because like a bunch of people on the internet decided it'd be funny to like trade up the price of GameStop. Like, why is... Twitter locked in a like an M&A deal with Elon Musk that neither party wants to, you know, carry out, it seems like, because um, of vibes. I'm a little bit joking, but I do, I do think like the era in which like you could kind of trade the markets based on like, quote unquote, fundamentals, like the cash flow yeah. of the company, you know, and the projected future, uh, you know, discounted cash flow, like that just feels like not how things work anymore in this way that like I as a non-professional money manager am very glad that like I don't have to like get up every day and try to like impose order on what seems to me like a fundamentally chaotic market right now. Yeah, I mean I I feel like some of the same dynamics that drive political coverage, media coverage, punditry on all this, sports punditry, now sort of drive the financial markets, <laughs> and particularly the crypto markets, in a way that is much less tethered to the fundamentals of the economy. Totally. I mean, what happened, I think, is that the, the attention economy just like swallowed the real economy. And so now you have like, you know, meme stocks and crypto and, uh, you know, like, you know, things like Dogecoin are like perfect examples of like a thing that was literally a joke. Like it was supposed to, Dogecoin was started as a mockery of all these dumb shit coins uh, that emerged during the first Bitcoin boom. And, you know, then it became worth like many, many billions of dollars in part because like Elon Musk thought it was funny and, uh, and tweeted about it a lot. And like nothing changed about Dogecoin it was yeah. purely that one day people like Elon Musk were not talking about it, and the next day they were. And suddenly people were becoming rich, actually rich. Um, so you mentioned this great point earlier, and you sort of uh, made an analogy to social media and how you wish that, like, back in the social media days, uh, the early days of back in the early days of social media, like, we had started asking some tough questions about what it might do to our society. Like, what are some of the questions you think we should be asking now about crypto um, before it goes the way of social media in terms of how it has transformed our society? Well, I think we should be uh, looking at the environmental question for sure, because that I think is a, a huge barrier to a lot of people, um, especially you know people who worry about climate change and energy use. And, and so I think that the time to sort of change those structures is, is now. Um, they don't get any easier to change over time. And I also think that we we really should start thinking about what decentralization actually is. Because mm -hmm. what's happening in crypto a lot right now is that, you know, a company comes along and says, we're decentralizing X, we're decentralizing social media, we're decentralizing art, we're decentralizing, you know, uh, sports gambling or whatever. And they set up a thing. And then, you know, the same six venture capital firms, like all fund them. And they, you know, get bought by some bigger crypto company. Um, and then you end up like with just the same thing we had before the decentralization, which is like a handful of giant companies funded by a handful of insanely wealthy investors just like own everything. And so you see this uh, sometimes with platforms like like OpenSea, which is the big um, NFT uh, 
trading platform, sort of like the eBay for NFTs, um, you know, which has become very centralized and has started acting in ways that have made some of its users say, like, wait a minute, weren't you guys supposed to be like not the the trusted middleman in all of this? Like, can you yeah. just can you like so I, I do think there's a real tension in crypto between the desires of the community to be decentralized and the desires of the people who want to make money from it, um, knowing that they can make much more money if things are centralized with them at the top. Yeah, it's hard to be fully de- the promise of decentralization often gives way to some some oligarch stepping in. <laughs> totally. In I mean, fishing. social me- social media was supposed to be decentralizing too, and it ended up with like four people controlling what everyone can say and do on the internet. Anarchy's hard to manage. <laughs> Turns out, <laughs> look, it's it's true, and 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 I think that like people who who think that crypto can like just swallow the whole government and like be, you know, the way that we make decisions and stuff should just like go to one city council meeting of like any town in America. Like governing stuff is really hard. Governing is hard. Governing is hard. Um, All right. Last question. I ask everyone, uh, what's your favorite way to unplug and how often do you get to do it? Um, Right now uh, I've got a, I've got a newborn. And so that is like by far my favorite way to unplug is hanging out with him. Um, Just, just chilling, just, Put a, put away the phone. Um, highly recommend uh, uh, having children as an antidote to excessive phone use. It, I mean, I was just on the road for a couple of days, which I, doesn't usually happen much anymore <laughs> between COVID and being a parent. And like just coming home last night and seeing Charlie and like spending a couple hours with him, putting the phone down, I was like, oh yeah, my real life now is I get to unplug a little bit more because when I'm not near him, it's just phone all the time because that's your instinct. So kids are kids are a great way to unplug. Who knew the solution to uh, excessive screen time was children. Procreation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kevin Roos, uh, thank you so much for joining Offline. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. 